great song, y'all. So good. Isn't that a blessing? Appreciate that. And uh, it's a great encouragement. And so I don't know maybe what you're going through, but uh, just trust in him. And uh, he's, he's at work in ways that you don't even realize, no doubt. That's a blessing. And thank you for the encouragement there. Let's go to Third John, if you would, please. A third epistle of John as we take another opportunity to have uh, some time here in some of John's writings. And this would, in our series, Love God's Way. So we just continued right in after finishing First John. And I uh, did two sermons in Second John. And so now Third John, and uh, we'll take at least a couple runs at it. Now, it's, it's the shortest epistle in the New Testament, um, but that doesn't mean it, it doesn't merit two, at least two, if not three messages or more, uh, certainly uh, would merit that for sure. And so we'll, we'll look at this here, and uh, then of course next week is Thanksgiving, and then we'll have one more message out of, out of 3 John. And so we're going to look at verses 1 through 8, uh, though we'll read just a little bit into the rest of the letter since it is so short, um, and it'll help to get the big idea of John's writing here. Okay, so verse number one says, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, uh, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I greatly rejoiced, I'm sorry, I rejoiced greatly rather, when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, Notice this, even as thou walkest in the truth. Does, it, does this sound familiar? Is it, have we been in First and Second John? I mean, it's, it's a repeated theme, this idea of walking in the truth. And then verse four is a great verse where he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That my children walk in truth. Beloved, now he gets into the essence of what he's communicating. Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey, after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. And then he describes these individuals, the traveling preachers, uh, evangelists, missionaries, church planners. We could put it in that context that we would identify because that for his namesake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. Look what he says in verse eight. We therefore ought to receive such. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be what? Fellow helpers of the truth. So fellow helpers, he says, to the truth rather. So look at verse number eight again. We therefore ought to receive such. Do you feel a contrast from Second John when he says, don't receive them? These, he says, receive them. And in, when you receive them, support them, receive them. He's saying when you do so, then you are a fellow helper to the truth. A fellow helper to the truth. And so we're gonna look at that here tonight. And I hope you get this idea that, that comes from the text here. And, and, and well, I'm sorry, let me read just a little bit further. I told you I was going to, then I forgot. Okay, verse nine. <laughs> he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds that he doeth. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> right? He says, basically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with that. And, uh, and then he talks about how he doesn't receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church, verse 10. Beloved, he says in verse 11, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. And then he talks about another individual in verse number 12, Demetrius, and he says, receive him. He's got a good report of all men. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this early church. And I think it'll be beneficial to us to see and understand this, that those who walk in truth help others on their journey. 
Those that walk in truth, I want to really emphasize that here tonight. Those who walk in truth help others, help others on their journey. So may God bless the reading of his word as you're seated. Let's consider this passage here tonight uh, together. <clears throat> you know, our, our missionaries um, often and regularly express appreciation for the care that they receive from Southwest Baptist Church and other churches. I mean, obviously, it takes a lot of churches for the work of missions to go forward. It really does in terms of support. Uh, the ladies just this past uh, Monday night had lift ladies in fellowship together. And one of the things they did is they wrote uh, letters, I believe it was for Miss Abby this time, and they wrote a bunch of cards. There's a hundred and, I don't know, 150 some ladies or maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, somewhere right in there. And uh, probably the mass, vast majority of them wrote a card for Miss Abby to open once they arrive on the mission field and she can open them one a day, one a week, I guess one a month, but that would kind of stretch it out. But uh, God's really used that. And we've, we've endeavored to do that. I appreciate the ladies' involvement in doing so. Uh, they just did one two months ago for Miss Sarah Hainline Montoro, uh, their daughter, uh, as they're gonna be going to Kenya, South Sudan this upcoming spring. And so can you imagine what that would mean to somebody who just arrived on the field? I uh, see Ms. Katie here, you, you received those letters, right? And opened them up uh, day by day, week by week, however you did it. And it was great encouragement, I'm sure, to those ladies. Um, and, and when you do that, ladies, you're being a fellow helper to the, those that go in the truth. You're, you're helping them. I, I just brought a short sampling of some of the letters of our own sent missionaries. Uh, we're getting ready for a missions committee meeting this upcoming uh, Sunday night. And just listen to some of the letters here. This is from Brother W.L. Smith and Miss Lucy. Dear friends and supporters, and I'm not gonna read all this, but the, he quotes uh, Psalm 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. To walk before the Lord and follow in his footsteps is always a great adventure. Our present year of missionary ministry has been no exception. We've been directed by the Lord to take several missionary journeys this year. There has also been journeys planned that God knew it was better for us not to take. Aren't you thankful that God knows what journeys we ought to take and which ones we ought not take? And God worked all that out and he says we covet your prayers as we try to follow the Lord's leading in each step that we take. Thank you seems so little to say uh, for your prayers and support. Our hearts are full of love for you as we join together in this worldwide ministry, all right? So you're, you're gonna hear a common theme here, and I'm not reading all the letters, just a little sampling again. This is from the Mueller's in Argentina. Greetings to you, uh, our dear praying friends. And then he goes through what has happened since their last letter, a lot of travel and a lot of blessings in their missionary journeys. And he says, thank you for praying and supporting us. Let's keep up the good work. The Lord is coming soon. <laughs> I love that. Uh, the Hainlines, um, Brother Chad and Miss Sarah and family, dear fellow servants. And in the letter, it describes their last couple months or so and that Brother Chad's been doing a lot of uh, flight training lately and all that's going into that. But thank you for your prayers and investment that you've made in reaching souls in Kenya and South Sudan. And then they sign it for his name, the Hainline family. To the Smutzlers, which by the way, I enjoy what Miss uh, Babishak Andrew was telling me this on the way to church tonight. Miss Babishak can write her card for the Smutzlers. Uh, talked about all the different ways that Babishak has been misspelled <laughs> and figured that Smutzler has also received equal treatment. And so anyways, that was her card of encouragement. But the Smutzlers uh, wrote to our friends and, fa and family in Christ Jesus. And then again, he explains what's going on and many different people that are in the church from different nationalities, even not just Mongolian people, but people from Japan and different locations that live in Mongolia. And then they sign it at the end. Thanks again for everything you do for us until next time. And then Rachel Looper, uh, serving with the Burgett family in, in Japan says, dear fellow laborers, thank you for your continued support. Are you hearing a common theme right here? Thank you for your continued support and faithful prayers. I'm praying, and she gives an update. By the way, she's doing much better in her health. That's a great blessing as she's been through uh, quite a bit. 
and mention some people that they're praying for, some Japanese individuals that need the gospel. I'm praying for you all and your outreach efforts in this upcoming holiday season. Uh, Brother David Merlo, who's in Argentina, the family's here tonight. And uh, he gives an update on little Sarah and how she's come along. But thank you so much for your faithfulness and prayer and financial support. So more Argentines can know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Switzer family. It's kind of neat. All of you are here this, uh, this time. But dear partners in the gospel, are you hearing a theme right here? Fellow laborers, fellow servants, partners in the gospel. And then Brother Jonathan gives an update as to their travels and the 10,000 miles, <laughs> mercy, that they've been on and reporting to churches and waiting on their visa. Thank you again for your faithful partnership in the work of the gospel. And, and so letter by letter, what, what we read, and as many of you know, keep up with letters and such, you're hearing things like that, our fellow laborers, our partners in the gospel, those that uh, we labor with in, in this upcoming uh, missions conference. I think this is the earliest that I've got us ready for the missions conference, but uh, here we are in November and it's really, I mean, it's just around the corner. So we have the Bufords to Uganda, the Brewers to Brazil, the Carneys that are serving in France, the Coley's in Kenya, the McCollum's in Germany, and then three new missionaries, the Parkers in Japan, Sandalas in Czech Republic, the Scuffums going to Cambodia, and then the Stensis going to Uganda. And, and they're veteran missionaries. So we've got missionaries that are coming. We've got missionaries that we support. Uh, may that continue until Jesus comes again because <laughs> there's such a need for the gospel. And so really what we're reading here in third John is a missionary letter and he's writing on behalf of other missionaries. That's really what he's doing. And he's saying to this dear church family and this dear individual that he loves the Lord, he's saying, listen, continue doing what you're doing. But, but he's also acknowledging this. There's going to be some testing uh, along the way. There's going to be some difficulty. And, and so our missionaries appreciate the support. I, I was just uh, today, by the way, at a... Uh, a 95th uh, birthday celebration um, for Miss uh, Miss Scruggs, Miss Peggy Scruggs, as she celebrates 95 years. How about that, man? What a what a blessing! But while we were there, uh, the Masons were there, George and Carol Mason, and they were telling us about little Landon, their seven-year-old great grandson, uh, the of uh, the Trimbles, of course. That uh, he knows, of course, the states and where they are, but he also knows this: what states have churches that support his family? Amen. Seven years old. Isn't that awesome? Hey, don't tell me that, that missionary kids don't pay attention to what's going on, you know, and how much they appreciate it. I think of the words of our dear friend who's in heaven now, Brother Carl Boonstra, when he uh, quotes or does the acronym, Together Everyone Achieves More. But I, I love his saying, just think what we could do together. Think what we could do together. William Carey. William Carey said this, there's a gold mine in India, but it seems almost as though at the center of the earth. Who would venture to explore it, he asked. I will adventure to go down, but remember, you must hold the ropes. William Carey said, there's a gold mine there and I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to go to India, but you as supporting churches, you've got to hold the ropes. Can I remind you here at Southwest Baptist Church, and I realize it's not March yet, but don't we need reminding along the way that missionaries count on us? They count on us to be faithful and to, and to be uh, serving the Lord with a fervent spirit. And, and so as we've read here in 2nd and 3rd John, both are dealing with traveling missionaries or traveling preachers. Some that we should not take on for support because they don't preach the truth. Okay. And they're not living the truth. That's second John. Third John is written about missionaries that we ought to support or that they were supporting, taking in, uh, being hospitable to. Of course, hospitality was such a huge need in their day and time and this part of their culture. Second John, if I might remind you here of this, second John, he's saying, listen, you can't let culture dictate your practice. Because what, what, is, what matters most here is doctrinal truth. And just because it would be culturally expected that you would take this preacher into your home and give them housing for two or three days, if they're not preaching the truth, John is saying, listen, don't have any part in that. 
okay? So that's what the message is of 2 John. Now in 3 John, these are preachers that you could support and should support, and yet there was a person in the church that wanted to have the preeminence, and we'll get to him in two weeks. You don't want to be known as the atrophies. And so Gaius is, is dealing with this individual, and I would suspect that Gaius is uh, the leader of the church here and uh, the pastor, pastor of the church, and he's dealing with this. And so John is saying here, listen, truth matters, and we ought to support those that are giving their lives to the truth. That's what he's getting across. But a, a big part of this letter is that just because, listen, this is where it ties into where we are, just because you've had a history of supporting church planning missionaries does not mean that that guarantees that it's going to be your future. And so because of the work of the gospel, it depends on churches like Southwest Baptist Church and our individuals within the church, then we ought to take heed to this letter here from John to this man named Gaius as he's explaining to him how to handle this delicate situation. And, and really, I, I want to try to get to what would be the key to us being, as we see in verse number eight, if you look at it again, fellow helpers to the truth, okay? Fellow helpers to the truth. How, what, what would be the key to us being that? Okay, so let's just, let's walk through the text here and notice some things. First of all, who's this man named Gaius? It could, I mean, most likely his name in Greek is Gaius, but most uh, of us in English, we would say Gaius, so... Anyways, uh, this man Gaius, there's other individuals in the New Testament known as Gaius that probably is not this man. All that we really know about this individual is what John writes about him. And so it's obvious that, that John and this man has a very close relationship. Um, he says, my children, that my children walk in the truth. Most likely, John probably led him to the Lord or had a big impact on his life. He's like a father in the ministry. John is like a father in the ministry to Gaius, just like I was saying a moment ago uh, about Brother Dave Disney and Brother W.L. Smith. And, and at one time, uh, Brother Smith was reminding me that Brother Dave Disney said, you know, all I really want to do is make a lot of money and, and drive a nice car and live in a nice home. But I thank God that God intervened in his life and sent him to the mission field of, of Chile. Hey, listen, he's got a lot more than what he would have had had he not done what God wanted him to do. Okay, so here's Gaius as, as he is truly loved of John. And look at verse number two, if you would. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now, we, we could spend a little bit of time on this verse, but let me, uh, let me, let me just say this. This shoots the prosper, prosperity gospel. Uh, it just blows it out of the water. Because here is John saying, listen, uh, I realize you're going through some physical struggles. The prosperity gospel says, well, if you follow the Lord, you're going to have great health and you're going to have great wealth. Well, there's a vast majority of our world that's truly following Christ that's not rich. So charismatic theology has it wrong. Okay. Now, John is saying this uh, to Gaius. He's saying, I, I, pray that, I pray that your health would match your spiritual health. I'm praying that your physical health would match your spiritual health. So evidently he had a good spiritual health, but maybe a poor physical health. All right, now I'm, I'm just going to throw this out here and we'll move on. If somebody prayed that for you, I pray that your physical health matches your spiritual health. How many of you would be on life support right now? Come on now. John is saying, hey, I pray that your physical health would match your spiritual health. Um, so the, the idea here is he was in good health spiritually. Are you? Are you? Um, we did a devotion last night and talking about how that in our family time, that bodily exercise profiteth little. Some of you emphasize that profiteth little part. And you're hanging on to that, right? That it just profits little. Well, it does profit. Just not as important as spiritual exercise and spiritual nourishment, okay? So John is saying here, listen, I'm so glad that you've got a good, strong, spiritual walk. All right, now look at verse number three. And I really believe that verse number three is key. He says, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth. Okay, so here's what's happening. There are people that went 
to the church where John or sorry where Gaius is involved, whatever level of involvement he has, and they came back to the church where John was, and they said things like this, man, I tell you what, it was a blessing to be at that missions conference. Man, it was a blessing to be in that church. It was a blessing. They, they took such good care of us. They put us up in these people's homes and they had such delicious meals and they accommodated us. They even gave us a great love offering. They sent us on our way. Man, we went away courage. We were tired because they had morning services and evening services. And we went soul winning. We did all of these things. But man, we went home refreshed. I'm ready to go again. That's what they were saying about, about uh, these individuals here with Gaius and others. They're saying, man, they were such a blessing. That's the first part of verse number three. And John says this, look at it. I rejoice greatly. Hey, you realize that when, when you and I are serving the Lord the way that we ought to be, it's a blessing to other people. He says, I rejoice greatly about this. They were such a blessing. I was so glad to hear that. And when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, and, and so the truth that is in thee, okay, so we got two things going on here. Verse number five, he says, I know that you do faithfully to the brethren and to the strangers. We'll, we'll get to that in just a little bit. So the way that they took care of them, but also this, hang on, let me hasten to say here. He's saying, I'm so thankful to God to hear that the truth is in you. That you haven't gone another direction, that you haven't compromised on the truth, but you walk in the truth. Amen. Look at the last part of, of verse number three again. I, I think this is so very key. As thou walkest in the truth. There's two things here. On one hand is this, Gaius, you are sound in doctrine. Sound in doctrine. Okay, now I want to apply to us, lest you think this doesn't have anything to do with you. Because it does. And it does with Southwest Baptist Church. If, if we're going to continue to get the gospel out and be a fellow helper to the truth, Southwest Baptist Church must remain sound in doctrine. You need to be sound in doctrine. Know, know what you believe. And know why we don't support those that believe you can lose your salvation. And know why we don't support Calvinists. And why we don't support the charismatic theology. And so forth. Hey, there's, we are limited on who we support because of the truth. But not only did they assent to the truth, they applied the truth. You're believing the right things, but you're also living the right way. Because truth is not just to inform, it is to transform. He says, I rejoice greatly. I rejoice that you are walking in the truth. The idea of walking is, is that you're living in the truth. Your life is governed by the truth. You're adhering to the truth. You're ordering your life by the truth. Sound in doctrine? But also this, what he believes shaped how he lived. Let me ask you tonight, can I please? Thank you. Does what you believe shape how you live? There's a great, great danger, especially being in church so often, that we are very good at hearing truth and even assenting to truth, affirming truth, quoting truth, singing truth, stating truth. It's college night, writing truth, preaching truth. But how good are you at living truth? Listen to what one man said. Uh, he said this, whoever walks in truth is an integrated believer. In other words, what, what he's believing is affecting how he's living. It's integrated. Are you following me here? I'm, I'm not going to move on to this verse until everybody gets this. So you, you got to get this. What he's or she is believing is integrated in how they're living. And I really do believe that that's a major issue in Baptist churches across America. But, but since other churches aren't here, how about Southwest Baptist Church? How about you? 
He says, whoever walks in truth is an integrated believer in whom there's no dichotomy between profession and practice. There's no difference. There's no conflict between what they profess that they believe and what they actually do. They are walking in truth. Does that make sense to you? They are living in truth. What they're hearing, they're applying. What they're reading, they're applying. It's showing up in their life. And, and John is saying, listen, I'm so thankful to God. I rejoice greatly that what you are believing is having an impact on what you're living. The way that you're living. On the contrary, he, this gentleman goes on to say, he says that there is an exact correspondence between creed and conduct. Okay, no, I, I realize we don't use that terminology, but, and I think that you're getting what I'm saying, but, but I gotta make sure that, that we're applying it. That there is an exact correspondence between creed and conduct, in other words, between what you say you believe and the way that you live. I'm not convinced yet that everybody's getting this. So important, because I, I, I would say that there are many here that would assent to God's holiness, but what you posted on your social media doesn't reflect that you believe God is holy and expects you to be holy. But you would say, oh, I believe. No, wait, wait a minute, hang on, let me just make sure. Does everybody here agree that God is holy? And that means set apart from sin and, and separated unto God. And so does he expect us to be holy? So why do believers post what they do on social media? And here's the deal. Here's the beautiful thing about me preaching this right now because I don't have social media. Amen. And I don't even know exactly what you posted, but I'm just assuming that somebody here, how, how are we doing? Is this, are, are we, you say, man, we just had a really good friend day, Brother Gaddis. Can we just have like a happy Wednesday? <laughs> like to celebrate what God did? Yes. As long as what we're saying we believe is matching up with how we're living. Because if you say that you believe in God's holiness and he expects you to be holy, but you're posting yourself half clothed. There, there, here's my social media response to that. <laughs> how, how am I doing it? How, how am I doing it? Is this making sense? I mean, come on, let's be for real. You say, why are you preaching this? Because I'm concerned about verse eight. And we're not going to have verse eight if we don't have verse three. And missionaries aren't going to be supported. And they're not going to be cared for. They're not going to be prayed for. And the missions conference is going to die. You say, man, you're being extreme. No, I'm not being extreme at all. Because that's exactly what he stated in verse number 3 and 4. And if verse 3 and 4 is not harmonizing in the church, then just, it's just a matter of time until they are not a concern at all about what God's given them to do. So it's one thing for you to say, yes, I believe in God's holiness. It's another thing that, that dictates how you live on a Friday and Saturday night. That's right. And what websites that you go to and what you text and what you read and what you say. It's one thing to say you believe God is holy and he wants me to be holy. And yet talking filthy is not right. right. You see the discrepancy here is uh, there ought to be a one-to-one -one correlation. There ought to be a correspondence between what you say you believe is truth and the way that it is lived out in your life. So you say that, you say you believe God is love and he wants us to be loving, and yet look at the way that you just handled that recent conflict. Does that make sense? I mean, you, you just lost it and, and you were upset and mad and angry and bitter and resentful and all those things and not forgiving, and yet you say God is love. Do you see how important this is? I'm telling you, friend, listen, we are on the very vein of the New Testament Christianity that it's one thing to say that you believe these things. It's a total another thing to actually act them out. Let me go one more level before we move on. And believe it or not, we might be near the end of the sermon. I'm not sure. But anyways, we're, we're closer than we were when we started. It's one thing to say, I believe, I assent to the truth of an exclusive salvation in Jesus Christ. I imagine everybody here believes that. Now, there may be somebody here that's not saved. I don't want to, I don't want to assume anything. There may be somebody that's not here and, and saved, but I'm preaching tonight to the Wednesday crowd of, of Southwest Baptist Church that knows there's a God in heaven, that knows there's a hell, that knows there's a heaven, that knows that there's one way. There's not a bunch of ways. And we know that we are not universalists. 
We know that God is not going to say, ah, just come on anyways. No, a person's got to hear the gospel so that then they can believe. They've got to hear it. And you know that, and you say that, and you assent to that, and yet you don't do anything about it. Last time you tried to get somebody to come to church, you said, man, Brother Gaddis, we had a good friend day. You remember that? We had a bunch of people here, and we did. Thank God in heaven for that. We saw adults saved, teens saved, and children saved. But I'm just simply saying, if we're not living, verse number three and verse number four, we won't have a friend day. Because there won't be anybody here that really even cares. I, I trust and pray that this is a preventative type message, maybe like what John was writing to, to this man named Gaius as he's saying, listen, I, I, I know what your history has been, but I also know what's going on right now. And if you don't apply what you learned here to this situation right now, then when it comes time for your future, it'll be off. As we keep going along at Southwest Baptist Church, we're always in jeopardy. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a reality kind of oriented person, maybe like you are as well. I'm just simply saying I know that, listen, what we've enjoyed in the past is not guaranteed in the future. Depends on verse three type living. And maybe I'm a little bit burdened about this now because as we keep burying a lot of the previous members of Southwest Baptist Church, like an Avenel Bowen and others, I did seven funerals this, this year, which is actually a lower number. Some of the other staff did others, so I, I don't know what the total is, but a lot of the older membership that love missions and missionaries, they're passing off the scene. Hey, hey, not just that, but actually a lot of the missionaries are either passing off the scene like we heard tonight with Dave Disney or retiring coming off the field. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I wonder, will there be missionaries that will write letters in the future? Hey, I'm not an alarmist. I'm not at all an alarmist. In fact, believe it or not, I'm actually very optimistic. <laughs> you say, well, man, plug some of that in here because we could sure use it tonight. I actually am. I, I sense, okay, I, I'm just going to share my heart with you tonight. I sense a, a great amount of synergy that's going on in, in our state of Oklahoma. We just experienced that last week, even with the preacher's meeting. There's some really good things going on in Oklahoma. Some church planning and church recovery. I think there's some good things going on there. I'm actually very optimistic about Heartland Baptist Bible College and the young people that are here and the young couples that are here and the older couples that are here. I think God's doing something. I, I see some synergy that's going in a good and right direction. I'm not just saying that trying to pump it up. I'm saying that because I really believe that. I'm excited about Southwest Baptist Church. I think there's some things that are going on right now that, that God is working and there's some synergy Synergy, not sin. But it's actually the same word when you read fellow helpers. Hmm. Fellow helpers soon is sin. It's the, like a, a together. Uh, it, that's the idea of it. Synergy is the same word there. And then the last word of helpers is like the word from which we get ergonomics. So it's working together. So there's some working together at Southwest Baptist Church and the buses are up. Amen. And the classes are up. And the effort and soul when he's up. You say, well, why are you preaching so negatively tonight? I'm not. I'm just simply saying, if we don't practice verse 3 and 4, we won't continue to see the synergy of verse 7 and 8. Is this making any kind of sense to you? So John is saying, listen, I'm so thankful to God that, that you are walking in the truth. You're taking what you're hearing and applying it to your life. I wish if I said that in, if I said that another 10 times that that would guarantee that everybody in this auditorium would do just that. And I'm minded to just keep preaching until it would guarantee that everybody does. That's how important it is. But you're saying, Brother Gaddis, we, we probably need to go home sometime. And you're right. But I'm trying to call as much attention to it as I can because the name is worthy. I said the name is worthy. That you wouldn't just say you believe these things and never do anything with them. The name is worthy that you would know these things and say, you know what? What I'm doing in my life here, here, and here doesn't match who I am here, here, and here. So what's going to give? Here, here, and here? 
No, that's not going to give. What ought to give is this, this, and this to get in line with who he is and what he's doing in your life. Verse three is the key. Because, watch this, and here we are at the very, very crux of it. Those who walk in truth help others on their journey. That's how it works. Those that, that are walking in the truth, the truth is having a real and measurable impact on their life and they're in a place then where they can be a help to people on their journey. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth, he says in verse number four. Now, I, I think in the context of that, it's talking about this spiritual leader who's saying, I'm so thankful that you're still living this. And I, and I, I sincerely say that about Southwest Baptist Church, not that you're my children or, or that I was here that long. You, you follow what I'm saying. But, but I'm thankful to God that people that maybe you've tried to impact or I've tried to impact to see them walking and trying to serve God. Oh, my soul. What a blessing. And obviously those of you that your parents are trying to invest in you and, and trying, to, trying to help you along, uh, my, I, I'm, I'm guaranteeing you this, you'll cause no greater joy to your parents but that you're trying to walk in the truth. But on the other hand, I'll tell you this, you'll cause no greater grief if you walk away from the truth. That verse works both ways. Okay, now, now we come to verse number five. Verse number five, look at, look at what he's saying. Okay, this is, uh, he says, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to the strangers. Okay, everybody get that? We've already covered it. He's saying, listen, you, you're already doing this. You do it to people that you know. You have missionaries in that you've had in several times. Like the Stensuses, we've had them here. And, and her parents are members in this church, so we know them very well. But we're about to have some other three families that we know because they're students and graduates of Heartland. And thanks be to God for that. But you'll get to know them better but we'll get to have them in our homes and have them in our conference. And that's what he's talking about here. And they literally didn't have a hotel to put them in or an Airbnb. They had them in their homes, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. And then the latter part of verse number six, whom if thou bring forward on their journey, that, that in other words, that's a very missions minded term where it says you bring them forward on their journey. In other words, you help them with whatever their need is. You help supply it after a godly sort, in other words, you do it in a way that's worthy of who God is, then you do well. Because look what they did in verse number seven. Look at it, if you would, please. Because that for his name's sake, that's it. That, that's why we're even gathered here tonight. Not for our name's sake. Not so we can have a rich history. Nothing like that. For his name's sake. They, he says, they went forth, that's missions, taking nothing to the Gentiles. There were people back in that time that would take advantage of crowds and, and just uh, fleece them. But he says this, these individuals have put themselves in such a place that they have to depend on the local church support. Man, we are getting to practice New Testament church planning. He's saying, listen, this is, what, this is what they've done for his name's sake. They've gone. If I could apply it here tonight, <clears throat> they've gone to Brazil. They've gone to Argentina. They've gone to Mongolia. They've gone to Sri Lanka. They've gone to Japan. They've gone to these other parts of the earth for his name's sake. And they need a church that'll be behind them all the way. Amen. Support them. We ought therefore to receive such, support them is the idea that we may be, and we've already covered this verse too, fellow helpers of the truth. How, how do you do that? Verse three and four. Did I mention verse three and four? Did we cover that one? It's got to start right there. Fellow helpers of the truth means this. You may not be known like some of those preachers are known, but as you show up and teach the four-year-old class, you're a fellow helper to the truth. What do you mean? Well, those little four-year-olds need to know there's a God in heaven that loves them. And you get to help them sit there quiet for about five minutes at least. <laughs> and help them with the truth. A fellow helper of the truth. 
And then as you work with the young people, the teenagers, Brother Seth, with emotion, told us about an individual that trusted Christ this, this Sunday for the uh, very first time visitor. And, and the individual came and had a really troubled past. But thanks be to God. Amen. She trusted Christ as her Savior. Ms. Sarah spent a good amount of time helping and, and I'm trying to be careful here because I don't know the situation completely and I don't know any kind of liberty that I have, but with emotion, Brother Seth shared that with us. And listen, you may never even make it up to the third floor. You may not even get to know that individual, but here's, here's how this works. If you are giving faithfully and praying faithfully, then you, my friend, are a fellow helper to that individual right. trusting right. Christ. And you may never meet them on this side, but you had an impact on their life. Right. Or you in the youth group, if you, you befriended this individual and you reached out to them and, and you made them feel included. Hey, you are a fellow helper to the truth. Amen. And whether you drive the bus, run, run, uh, I almost said run from the bus. That's right. You run to the door from the bus. Everybody follow what I'm saying there. You run to help kids get on. You're a fellow helper to the truth. You knock doors and invite people to come. You're a fellow helper to the truth. You pay tithes and offerings and, and uh, thank God for that. You just helped buy two buses this week in an auction. Amen. Amen. Kevin and Brother Carl went up and looked at a couple buses and, and thought that they were good buses. And so we won the bid. Amen. Two more buses in the fleet. They will be painted soon. Amen. Right? Fellow helpers of the truth. Is this making sense? Yes, sir. Hey, we've had a good history of a bus ministry, but that doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to have a future in it if we don't do verse 3 and 4 and practice what's right today. Because there might be a doctor fees in here that says, I don't think we need to do bus ministry anymore. Huh? Um, tonight's college night. You know what we get to be at Southwest Baptist Church? Can I just clear off a spot right here to say this? What we get to be at Southwest Baptist Church is a fellow helper to the truth by being a host church to the Heartland Baptist Bible College. Amen. And we get to see students lead singing and get to see them preach, get to see them sing and give testimony, get to knock doors with them, work classes with them. And, and you might be inclined to say, oh, let's just let them do it. No, 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 they need you. Because you're there to be a fellow helper to the truth with them and, and show them how to love little kids and show them how to love teenagers and show them how to love adults and show them how to care about souls and show them how to put God first. Hey, you got to be a fellow helper to the truth. And I thank God tonight for the 25 years that Southwest Baptist Church has done just that. But the past does not guarantee the future if we get off on verses three and four. And we no longer care about the truth like we ought to care about the truth and care about souls the way that we ought to and apply who God is to today's generation. And if there's not a new generation of Southwest Baptist Church that has a heart for heartland, there'd be a few diatrophies or diatrophas who gets in here and talks to her husband or talks to his wife or talks to this family and that family and say, man, they got my pew again. <laughs> we have the wonderful privilege of being a fellow helper to the truth. But Seth, when I think about this verse, I think about a fishing trip we had when Tyler was little, four years old, I think had a little fishing pole like that long, like a, I don't know, Batman pole or something like, you know what I'm talking about? You know, the little, but the Merlot took us out to fish at a lake down at his aunt's and Alec. And uh, he had the boat, I think Russ Bishop went with us as well and Russ went and, and, and they had paid for the fuel. I think I went in on the donuts or something like that. And maybe a little bit on the bait, brought tackle. I'm just simply saying, you know, the little guy showed up there. He didn't pay for a boat. He didn't pay for a pole. He didn't pay for anything, you know, but he was just there to fish. And if he didn't catch the biggest fish of the day. <laughs> Brother Seth brought his famous uh, fishing bait called Booyah. I mean, that just, just saying the name will cause fish to come up in the boat. <laughs> Booyah, you know? And so they're out there and he was, Tyler was out there throwing that, that line out and, and casting that Booyah and said, Booyah. And, and you got to say Booyah when you catch one. <laughs> booyah. And, and real, I mean, a big old fish just gets bigger every time I tell the story. <laughs> but I got to tell you, I was there. You know what my job was? I held the net. It'd be wrong for me to say, I caught that fish. That's the atrophies. Huh? 
Hey, what we're there to do is just be a fellow helper to the truth. Somebody drove, somebody paid, somebody got the booyah, somebody did this, somebody did that, but we all get to be a part of it. Is this making sense right here? Fellow helpers of the truth. If we'll take what we're hearing and it's truth and we apply it and we live it out and we let it guide us step by step on this adventure. There'll be another generation of Southwest Baptist Church that's trying to help people come to the truth. Because there's people here that are living it. That's the key. Living it. Let's stand together here tonight. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope that it's been a great help to you. I hope it's been a challenge to our church here on the hills of Friend Day. I thank God for it. But we, folks, we have got to continue applying what we know to be the truth of God's word. And it's not just that we lose what we have, it's that people stay lost. How many souls in the northeast part of our country desperately need church planning? So there needs to be churches like Southwest Baptist Church who just do this week by week, be faithful. Doing the work of the ministry, caring about souls here and caring about souls there. You can't go over there, you won't live in New York City. Some of you maybe wouldn't do that, but, and you won't do that. But there's a family and there's families that are willing to. And I thank God that we've been able to be a part of it along the way. It's so exciting. So exciting. Father, thank you tonight for this, this uh, passage here. And uh, God, the the simple and yet profound truth that here's a man that was walking in the truth, applied it to his life, and you used him to be a helper of the truth. So help us, God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 272, only trust him. If God has spoke to your heart tonight, maybe there's a discrepancy between what you know to be true and the way that you're living. I urge you tonight to get that settled first and foremost. And then also that you'd have a heart. Get that straight. And then the other of having a heart for, for what God is doing in the gospel will come into place. Page 272, only trust him. For there and as you lead us. <clears throat>